Wouldn't it be fantastic if you could actually hear Ben Hogan tell you how important his golf swing was? Well, we found footage that shows you him being interviewed by Father Kelly in the 1950s and Ben Hogan describes the most important element of his golf swing. The secret is not in the dirt. Watch this and I'll get back to you. Ben, uh, some time ago, if I recall correctly, you said that golf is 40% uh, in the hands physically and about 60% in the mind. Is it, do I get it correct? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I believe it's about 30% golf swing and golf game and 70% uh, between the years. Oh, very good. I mean by that is uh, so many fellows uh, uh, have a wonderful golf swing, even as a matter of fact, much better than mine. Uh -huh. But they haven't trained themselves into co in competition oh, yeah. to think the thing out for four days. That's seventy-two uh -huh. holes, eighteen, de uh, 18 holes each day. Uh -huh. uh, they haven't. They've trained their muscles and their golf swing, but they haven't trained their mind to to uh, uh, coordinate and to uh, keep going for the four days. You know, oh, and, and think these things out. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's management out on the course. Is, is, uh, well, they, they, if I catch it correctly, they have the ability. It's just bringing it out. Huh? They have plenty of ability. As a matter of fact, uh, golf, uh, a game that you would play here, for instance, and a game in a golf tournament, that's two different games entirely. You play a little different, you think a little yeah. different, and that's that's the thinking that uh, some of the fellows do not have, yeah. only because they haven't trained themselves in enough competition yeah. and uh, worked hard enough, actually, yeah. between the ears to, to yeah. uh, keep all their faculties together for four days. I'm so glad you say that, because so many people play themselves down. They don't know they have the ability. When I speak to different audiences, especially young people, uh, I look out at them and I can see I, uh, uh, the terrific power that they have, power of writers or teachers or the good that they could do in government and different things. Uh, they don't know how wonderful they are, as I make a comparison, just like that back in your old home state of Texas. I mean, it's the oil is there, they don't put it there, all they have to do is scratch the surface. It's there. <laughs> sure. But uh, uh, that, that if they get a purpose, you had a purpose, so you've never made your comeback. If they have a purpose, and we try to elevate that purpose to love of God, love of country, I mean, nothing will stop them once they realize how much they count, they're, they're, what they can do. Ben, there's an awful lot I want to talk to you about on this game. All right, Father. I have a lot to learn. Yeah. Uh, a little while ago, you were telling me, uh, you pointed out that 70-30 differential. Would you do me the favor of, sh of applying that by hitting a few balls? I'd love to see you hit them. Well, I'll try Would you do it? Surely. All right, thanks, Ben. Got a ball, Bill. Do you want to see it? Oh, you'll buy. How far is okay, that? Okay, How far is that, Ben? Oh, about 220. Shock horror. You've just heard Ben Hogan say that 60%, no, 70% of his game is mental. Only 30% was his swing. So, even as an instructor years ago, I, I after seeing this, why do I obsess about the 30? I have to obsess about all of it to get good at golf. There's no doubt that Ben Hogan had a great swing, but it wasn't just the swing that made Ben a great player. And you heard it with his own mouth, his own words. 30% was his swing, 70% was mental. And, you know, he admitted that uh, basically there are other people with better swings than him, you know, so, he knew he didn't have the best swing. So he knew, knew he didn't have the best swing. He knew that it was mainly mental. So let's not get too hung up on whether we're hitting that magic position. Because yes, the swing is still 30%, but 70% is mental. And in his next clip, you're going to see Ben talk about what he feels sorry about 
in this generation of golfers. So I'll get back to you again after the next clip. Enjoy. My family wasn't rich, they were poor. Uh, I feel sorry for, for uh, rich kids now. I really do. Because they're never going to have the opportunity I had. Uh, because I knew tough things. And I had a tough day all my life. And I can handle tough things. They can't. And every day that I progressed was a joy to me. And I recognized it every day. So, there's another video with Mr. Hogan saying how he feels sorry for rich kids. Kids that not had to go through anything. I mean, whether he'd want to go through what he went through, I mean, he witnessed his own father's suicide. His family then went bankrupt. His mother had to get all sorts of jobs there to move town. He took up golf to basically earn money uh, for the household. Uh, he then, at 16, had to play in a, a, a match against Byron Nelson, of all players, to win because at 16 you had to leave the country club you couldn't caddy anymore and the only way you could stay on was with the sponsorship uh, a scholarship if you won the caddies championship and he lost that championship in a playoff to byron nelson so he had to leave and go to the scrabby municipal and byron nelson got to stay all those things and more i mean him going bankrupt twice in life on tour in, in talking about the biggest check he ever saw was $350. All those things point to a guy that never ever gave up, he persevered. I mean, he didn't have an option B. He didn't have an Ivy League college degree. Uh, he didn't have rich parents, you know, to fall back on. He only had golf. And there is something to be said when you only have option A to go for. And he had option A, and he went for it and he eventually got it uh, but uh, and then you can see how that 70% really worked so in this next clip you're going to see Bob, Dr. Bob Rotella talk about his uh, the Ben Hogan book Five Fundamentals and talking about something you've probably never read in the book even if you read it cover to cover so I'll get back to you again after the Bob Dr. Rotella video. Enjoy. Well, it's, it's, it's right out of the modern fundamentals of golf, which I thought would appeal to all of you. Um, but many, many times I've given this and read it to a lot of the tour players I've worked with. And I thought it'd be worth taking a moment to read. It says, most golfers acquire confidence over a period of time. Hogan had great confidence and a great swing. He played with a coolness and a confidence that he was even a marvel to the Scots who coined the phrase, the wee ice one. Of the two, the swing and the confidence, he attained the swing first. Even after he had a swing that would win tournaments, he still had periods of uncertainty. He describes how it happened. I never felt genuinely confident about my game until 1946. Up to that year, well, I knew once I was on the course and playing well, that I had the stuff that day to make a good showing. Before a round, this everybody can identify with. Before a round, I had no idea whether I'd shoot 69 or 79. I felt my game might go sour on any given morning. I had no assurance if I was a little off my best form, I could still produce a respectable round. My friends on the tour used to tell me that it was silly to worry that I had a group swing. And you know, first time I saw that, I said, well, how many people in the world can identify with that? But my self-doubting never stopped. Regardless of how well I was going, I was still concerned about the next day and the next. In 1946, my attitude suddenly changed. I honestly began to feel that I could count on playing fairly well each time I went out, that there was no practical reason for me to feel that I might suddenly lose it all. I guess that what lay behind my new confidence was this. I had stopped trying to do a great many difficult things perfectly because it had become clear in my mind 
that this ambitious over-thoroughness by perfectionism was neither possible nor advisable or even necessary. All you needed to group were the fundamental movements, and there weren't so many of them. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, but at about the same time I began to feel that I had the stuff to play credible golf even when I was not at my best, and my shot making started to take on a new and more stable consistency. Now, you'd be amazed how many tour players, when I read that to them, have said to me, that can't be in that book. I've read that book over 300 times. I've never seen that. And I look at him and I say, well, because when you were reading that book, you were looking for a way to perfect the golf swing. You weren't looking to hear Ben Hogan say, you got to get out of your way and let it go and make it simple. And it's been very useful for a lot of guys, which is why I share it with you. Because this is a game where you have to learn some skill, and you sure have to have a nice motion and a nice movement, but you also have to go out on the golf course and play golf. And like a lot of people, when they hear me talk about letting go, some people think that means I want you to be flippy or just all kinds of crazy things. I tell them, no, what it means is I want you to let go of conscious control over the motion. And that's what you need to do when it's time to play the game. And so, I mean, I've started with a lot of players with that because I think it really hits the nail on the head for a lot of people who've been so bogged down in, in the golf swing that they haven't ever let themselves go play the game. Uh, so, there we go, the video from Dr. Rotella. And what does that tell us? It tells us that uh, Hogan gave up on perfect in 46 and then started winning a lot more. Funny thing is, prior to 46, he'd won the PGA money list three times, Varden Trophy twice. So he'd been successful, but he didn't have confidence in his game. 46, all of a sudden, he believed he'd, he could do it, as he said. And I think it's because he just got out of the way of himself and wasn't trying to be absolutely perfect. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of you can remember times you've scored really well, whatever your handicap, and you're not thinking, am I swinging perfect? But the ball's going really well. And I think that's something to keep in mind. The scorecard doesn't need a story. It wants a number. And Hogan got very good at giving it numbers. You know, one thing we see here with this 70% is perseverance, off the chart perseverance. We see a guy that's willing to change and adapt. Uh, we see a guy that won't give up. And we see a guy that is prepared to stop doing things that don't work, i.e. trying to be perfect, accepting he hadn't got the best swing on tour, but he could win. And so hopefully from this set of videos, you'll see that Hogan's uniqueness is largely due to down to his personality and his perseverance and that's 70%. It's not down to some magic move in his swing. You know, we, we almost belittle someone like Hogan to say, oh, he was only good because he had a secret move. No, Hogan was good because he had an incredibly robust mind. And uh, so I think we can learn more from this than some so-called kind of secret move that he did. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, it's changed the way I teach because, you know, Hogan, you know, uh, he, was, he was all about almost as a man think, so shall he be. And so Hogan was great at that. So this is going to be the last video before Christmas. So I'm wishing you all a happy Christmas. If you haven't already, press the like and the subscribe. We're going to do more videos in 2020, keeping it simple. And you can see now why I like the Ernest Jones so much, because in effect, Hogan was pretty much, he was the technical guy. He was quite simple, and it was only 30% of his game was a swing. So, from Andrew Lynch Golf, have a great Christmas. Till next time, take care. Bye.